Now I would, it's my honor to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, Dr. Ann Bainbridge Freimeyer, who's the Associate Dean for Miami's Graduate School. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? So I'm okay. I need to use this microphone so they can catch me on the, uh, on the video, but and if you can hear me, I'm not going to use the, use the other, uh, other mic. So, um, as uh, Jennifer said, I'm the Associate Dean at the Graduate School, and I'm also a professor in the Department of Communication here. Um, and I've worked, been here at Miami for um, quite a few years and worked with uh, graduate students here, and I've also worked with some graduate students at other universities as an outside member um, and, and been involved in graduate education during my career. Um, and advise a number of students. Um, I want to uh, go and talk kind of about two different areas. One, some things that I think you should know that you may or may not already know, and then some things that you probably want to do. And then I'm going to open it up for questions, um, and so we'll and we can talk from there. So some things that you should know. One of the things you probably already know this in one sense is that graduate education is very different from undergraduate education in terms, especially in terms of looking for a program. When you were looking for an undergraduate institution, you were looking at the entire institution, what was to offer, where it was located, all the services, all the different majors, and you were looking at it very broadly, and that's exactly what you need to do when you're looking for an undergraduate institution. And you apply to that institution, and while you might have had a major in mind, you weren't committed to that major. It wasn't like you, you, know, you, you could change your major, and probably a lot of you did change your majors after getting here. Graduate education, you're applying to that department, that program. Now, you do apply to that institution, but it's really, off, for most of the times for graduate education, the decision making is done at the department level. And if that department wants you in their graduate program, the university is most likely going to admit you unless you have some dark, deep secrets in your closet that makes you a bad person that nobody wants. <laughs> so um, it's really much more at the department level. And then you're committed to that major, that program. You're not going to be switching very easily. Um, so when you're looking at graduate programs, you're not really looking at the entire university nearly as much as you're looking at that program and the faculty in that program. And the faculty in that program are really what's going to make the difference between a good quality graduate program and not such a good quality, and especially from your experience. And they may have great faculty, but it may not be the right fit for you if you don't have, if there's not the faculty member there that's going to be uh, somebody who could be a potentially mentor for you. Um, another thing uh, to keep in mind is that there are generally two types of graduate programs academic programs and professional programs. Sometimes they get a little blurred, but that's generally uh, the two categories. So many of you are familiar with professional programs like law school, medical school, those kinds. Those are examples of professional graduate programs where you're getting a degree and it's preparing you for a particular profession and it's very professionally oriented. Other examples are um, masters of public health, uh, masters of Social Work, um, there's a lot of them out there. Um, there's a whole alphabet soup of different professional degrees. Versus academic degrees, which are generally your Master of Arts, Master of Science, and your PhD. And academic degrees are the traditional degrees. Those are the ones that first existed back in the days when the only reason you went to graduate school is if you wanted to teach at a university. Um, and because that's been a long time ago. But those academic degrees tend to be more research focused and they tend to be focused on that specific discipline. And if you want to become a professor institution, then that's the direction you go. You, know, you get an academic degree. But those degrees aren't just for preparing people to be professors. Um, but you got to look at those carefully if you don't want to be a professor. If you're getting a Master of Arts in History, you need to be, have your eyes wide open in terms of what can you do with a Master of Arts in History if your plan is not to go on and get a PhD in history and then to seek a, 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 a teaching position at a university. Okay, so you need to look very carefully at those. Those are, can be really good degrees, but they have a little different focus. They re, tend to be research oriented. 
um, kinds of, of degrees. Um, where professionally oriented degrees may involve a good deal of research emphasis as well, but they're going to be more focused or um, more directed towards a particular um, profession or preparation for a particular kind of, of, of work. Um, going along with that are thesis versus non-thesis programs. Um, most, all academic programs typically offer, you required to do a thesis for a master's and a dissertation for a PhD. Okay, and those are, what makes a thesis a thesis or a dissertation a dissertation is that those are original scholarly works. So as a master's student um, doing a thesis, that means you would be doing probably a research project or some kind of scholarly project that could, may, might be publishable, um, but that would be the direction. And so it's a formal process that has formal chapters and, and so forth, and you prepare for that. Um, and then a PhD requires a dissertation, um, absolutely. You can't do a PhD without doing a dissertation. Now at master's programs, though, many of them have a non-thesis option. Um, and so a non-thesis option is pretty broad. Um, a non-thesis can look a lot like a thesis. It might be more along the lines of, a, of some kind of a project that's very related to a specific uh, career goal or something, maybe very applied and practical kind of thing. Um, but one of the things to be on the lookout for when you're looking at master's degrees is that most, and I'm saying most because there are some exceptions, most quality master's programs have some type of culminating project, whether it's a thesis, or it might be called a non-thesis, or it might be called something else, like a project or a practicum or something, but there's some kind of project, something that's usually written, it usually has some kind of a presentation or a defense that goes along with it, um, that it comes at the end of the, of the program and that you have to pass in order to get your degree. Um, there are some master's programs that are only coursework, but you really want to look at those carefully and make sure if you're looking at a master's that is only coursework, to make sure that that's the norm in that, for that degree, that discipline. Um, because a, most, a lot of programs, a lot of disciplines, that's not the norm. Um, a coursework only master's degree is not going to provide that same level of quality of an experience as one that has that culminating project. That's considered the norm um, and the standard is to have some kind of project. So that's something to look at. Um, so that's an important difference. Um, one other um, thing to, to think about with it's important, and then I'm going to want to focus on some things you should, should be doing, um, is that fit into the department is a very important part of graduate education. Um, when you're a graduate student, you're kind of living in that department. Uh, you don't necessarily, you may not really hardly enter another building on campus, another academic building, uh, because typically you don't live on campus as a graduate student. There are a few exceptions. And you're typically, you're in wherever that department. Um, if you're in, a, in geology, you're going to be in that building where geology is housed. That's where you probably would have maybe an office or space. That's where your classes are going to be. That's where the faculty are. That's where you live. You're going to spend a lot of time with those faculty and with the other graduate students who are in that program. So if it's not a good fit, then that's not a good situation because that's where you're at. You're not going to have a lot outside of that. So um, finding a program, a department, the faculty, who you like and who you think, yeah, I can live with these people. Um, it's a little bit like either dating or marriage for that time. <laughs> you're really kind of making a commitment um, with that person. Um, OK, so some things that um, you, you want to do. One. Um, obviously, you've got to research your degrees and your programs. Okay, well, how do you do that? The best place to start is by going to your current instructor's advisor. So if you're in the history department and you're thinking about a master's in history, or if you're in geology and thinking about geology, go to your faculty. Go to the faculty that you trust the most, you know the most. If you don't know anybody really well, think, of, okay, well, who seems to really be on top of things? Make an appointment with them to talk about graduate education and ask them, tell them what you want to do, you know, what are your interests. So number one thing I guess you need to do is understand why do you want to go to graduate school? 
what do you want to get out of this? What are your career goals? Um, you need to have a good reason to go to, to graduate school, so you need to be able to explain that in, in a minute or two to, the, um, to your professor and ask them for their advice. What might be a good program for you to go to? Who else might you talk to? They might direct you to another faculty member who might be right up that alley. But your faculty are some of your best sources of information because the faculty here, they're engaged in the discipline. They go to conferences. They publish. They know people across their disciplines across the United States and oftentimes throughout the world. So they know what's going on in the discipline and where those programs are. Okay. Um, if you're looking for a program that's kind of unique or, you know, s that we don't have anything similar to that at Miami, it's a little bit more challenging. But with a few, reaching out to a few different faculty members, you can probably find somebody who can provide you some guidance. And then, of course, the internet's a great place to search. Um, be careful about your search terms. Look specifically. Um, recognizing that there's a lot of for-profits out there who are really much more interested in, in getting a warm body there than necessarily getting somebody who's well suited. So you got to screen those out. Once you start finding some programs that look interesting, you got to dig deep into their websites and look for their curriculum. Okay, because if you're applying to that master's program, look, they're going to have their curriculum someplace on there in terms of what are the courses that are required, what are the requirements for the degree, and study those. What are they, is it real specific? Is it lockstep? You've got to take these, uh, these 10 courses um, for the degree. Uh, is a thesis required, or is there a non-thesis option? Um, what are, are the steps? And look into specifically to that um, so you really understand what they're offering. The second thing you want to look for on those websites are look at the faculty. Okay, um, and one of the ways then to find, find out what they're doing, they may have like a biography, some page, you know, websites they'll have a biography on each faculty member and so forth. Get their, write down their names, go to Google Scholar and put them in and see what comes up for them. That's the quickest way to find out what are they doing? What are their areas of expertise? Because they will have published on that area probably. If not, if you're finding nothing on Google Scholar, you probably want to then keep looking. <laughs> uh, because any graduate faculty should be engaged in scholarship. And um, if their scholarship, if you can usually find it on Google Scholar. Um, so that's the best way to find out what are they interested in? What's their most recent publications? Um, and if you're not interested in anything that they're doing, it may not be a good fit. Okay. Um, what you really want to do is you want to side up or, or get, uh, find a faculty member who's what they're doing, what they're interested in, is something that you're interested in. Okay. Um, that's going to make the best mentor relationships because good graduate education is largely about mentoring. You're going to have co take courses and so forth, but the people who get the most out of their graduate education and who do the best are the ones that have good mentors. And part of having a good mentor is being a good protege, meaning you find somebody who's a good match, and then you are willing to work with them. And you put forward the effort, and then they often are willing to help you throughout your life um, as a good mentor. So that's part of what you're looking for. It's not uh, just a program that on the surface that sounds like it's what you're interested in, but the curriculum is something that interests you, and then the faculty are people who are doing things that you find interesting and that you want to work with. Okay? Um, so those are really important things to do. Um, another important thing to do, if at all possible, and I know sometimes this isn't possible, visit the program. So once you narrow that list down to two or three of your favorites, the top ones, Call, every program is going to have a graduate director. That's usually, sometimes they have a little different term, but there's going to be a graduate director. That's the person who's in charge, the faculty member who's in charge of recruiting and admissions for the, their graduate program. Cont and that's, that's usually the person who's listed on the website to contact for more information, that kind of thing. Call them up, email them, and find out when you can come and visit. Make an appointment. And there's three people you want to visit, see when you make your visit. You want to meet with the graduate director. That's kind of mandatory, probably you know, no, a no-brainer. 
ask to see if you can make an appointment with another faculty member there. And so when you've done your research, if there's a faculty member on that list, you say, oh, I really find his or her re research interesting. Ask if you can have an appointment with that person, meet with them for a half hour or an hour to talk to them about their research, about their graduate program, and so forth. The third person you want to meet with is ask to meet with a current graduate student, somebody who's currently in the program, okay? Because you're going to get a totally different perspective about the graduate program from a current student than you will from the faculty. And both perspectives are important. Okay, neither one are complete, so you need to meet with both so you can get a, the more of a complete picture. Okay, and when you're meeting with those people, all three of them, you want to ask, there's some questions you want to ask of them. Um, one is, how long does it take to complete this program? And there's kind of like two parts to that question. You know, it may say, obviously, this is a two-year program. Okay, it says it's a two-year program. Okay, now tell me, how long does it take to complete this program? One of the problems in graduate education, more so in P at the PhD level than the master's, but it's a problem at the master's level too, are people not finishing degrees. They come in and they do the coursework and then they never finish that thesis or non-thesis project and then their funding runs out, so forth, and they just go away and they never get their degree. And so that obviously that's not the path you want to take. Some programs have a bad reputation for that. They're not good about helping their students finish. And so asking that question about how long does it take, um, what's the completion rate, um, and so forth. And, and, and you're going to get maybe a different, and if you get different answers from everybody you talk to, that's probably a red flag. Um, and really listen to, well, that's really a question you also want to ask that current student. Um, the other thing, particularly to ask the current student, is how accessible are the faculty? How accessible are the faculty? Can you go knock on their door um, at most any time and uh, be able to talk with them if you have a, you know, a question or a problem or something? Um, in graduate education, you should be spending a lot more time in your faculty's offices than what you probably do as an undergraduate. Um, but accessibility is really important. I know when I was working on my doctoral degree at West Virginia University, um, one of the things that made that a great program and a great, de great degree is that I could not only knock on my chair, my, the, my advisor's door most any time, I could call him any time, really, um, if I wanted to. He was available. But I could also knock on anybody else's door and they would be willing to talk to me, to ask a question, to work with me on something. Um, and so it's that kind of um, availability that really can make the difference between a program. Um, so I think those, those are the big things to do. So what questions do you have at this point? It's okay. Um, it's typically fine. Now, there used to be a little bit of a bias if you did all three degrees at the same place. If you're planning on doing your master's and your PhD, you know, the advantage of going someplace else is, is you're exposed to other, other faculty. Um, but it, it's not a huge deal if um, the advantage, as I said, you, you, you work with different people of going someplace else, but it's not a big deal. Other questions? If you're applying to work in a specific program and you have to apply to work with one professor, if that professor happens to be the graduate advisor, can you do that or do they not accept Oh, no, they, they want, okay. they, they're looking for students too. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, because a graduate advisor is typically just a regular faculty member who has taken on the service requirement, or somebody's got to do the recruitment. Somebody's got to be the graduate advisor. And so typically somebody might do it for five or six years and then they, somebody else takes over, so. Oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, got to do that. The question was, um, if the graduate, if you want to work with the, the graduate advisor, is that okay? Yeah, and yes it is. Other questions? So how difficult is it to get into master's programs versus PhD programs? 
Well, generally PhD programs are more selective. Are you thinking about going directly into a PhD program as opposed to going into a master's program? Okay. And then how difficult is it going to be to get to the PhD? Um, Yeah, probably PhD programs are, are more selective, but there's also probably, um, if by the time you've finished your master's degree, you're going to have probably a pretty good sense of whether or not you're suited for a PhD program. And if you're suited for a PhD program, and your faculty are going to advise, you know, let you know probably that too. Um, and so if, then it's, it's, you know, not probably any harder than it would be to get into a master's program in a sense. What are the options for teaching as a graduate student? Good question. Um, those academic programs I was talking about, those kinds of degrees, they're the ones that are probably most apt to have uh, assistantships. And so an assistantship is typically a traditional assistantship provides you with a tuition waiver and a stipend. Um, so for instance, here at Miami University, students are on an assistantship, they get their tuition waiver, about 93% of their tuition is waived and they pay fees and then they receive a stipend, and the stipends vary a great deal by discipline, okay? Um, and then they typically teach or do research um, during, for about 20 hours, for 20 hours a week or so. Um, now there are other funding options, such as scholarships, fellowships, and so forth, and that varies a good deal by what kind of program you're applying to. Um, one of the things, the other kind of piece of information is there's a lot of variation by discipline in terms of what the norms are for applying, for funding, uh, all those kinds of things. And so that's where going to a faculty member who's in that discipline can give you that detail about what the norms are. There's some, um, if you're going to law school, there are scholarships, but you're not going to get an assistantship most likely. That would be probably quite rare. Um, where if you're getting a um, Master of Science in Geology, the standard would be to have an assistantship. For instance, in the Department of Chemistry here at Miami, they won't admit you unless you, they have an assistantship to award you because those assistantship duties, doing research and teaching, are as much a part of the degree and part of the learning experience as the coursework and the works, work in the lab. So if they don't have a funding for you, they're not going to admit you. Okay, but then there's other programs where they don't have any funding <laughs> uh, for students to speak of, and so they're looking for students um, who need, were willing to pay tuition for their degree. Okay, and so that's something to yeah obviously consider. Uh, you just mentioned like we can make an appointment with the professor faculties in graduate school about the, the research area. So uh, like the, the appointment like you, you mean uh, it's like face to face, like the, the meeting should be face to face, or we, we can just like the, the professor is opening to, to like Skype meeting, like online meeting, what kind of- You're talking about the here at Miami or when you're talking get uh, advice? Yeah, and, and, yeah, and other- right Or at other institutions? Yeah. Okay, the question is can, um, is it have to be a face-to-face -face meeting or can you Skype with the person? Yeah. If you can do face-to-face, -face, I think that's, um, that's preferable. You know, that's a more, uh, there's certain things that um, happen in a face-to-face -face interaction that may not happen in a, in, a, in a Skype. But to Skype with somebody is probably better than to email if they, you know, um, in terms of getting information and being able to exchange. So. You know, the, the point is you need, to be, you need to interact with folks in order to get information. And so if face to face is, and be able to visit and be able to see things and, and experience the whole department's better. Okay. okay. Um, how much does your, or how much weight does the GRE score have? Okay. How much, how much weight does the GRE score have? And I wish I could give you a nice, precise answer, um, but, I, but I can't. The, First of all, not all graduate programs require the GRE. Um, certainly law school was at the LSAT and, and um, MBAs require the um, um, GMAT, so there's a number of other tests. But for programs that require the GRE, um, 
generally, and what um, ETS, the um, organization that, that does the GRE, what they recommend departments, how they recommend they use that, is to use that each score separately as a piece of information in light of and to be used along with your um, GPA and your transcripts, what institution you attended, the layers of recommendation, and any other admission materials required. So what's all, they're encouraged to be used holistically. To be honest, though, there are some departments who receive large numbers of applications who will use the GRE as a screening tool. If you don't have this score, then they don't even bother to look at your application. Um, that's not how the score was intended to be used. But. So that's one of the things you know to, to ask about and, and to try to figure out is when you're applying to programs. Is there like a, like, I know there's a lot of different programs that help people with GRE, like Kaplan and mm -hmm. Instagram Video. Is there one that you would recommend over the other to help? Is there a, okay, the question is, is there a program I would recommend to prepare for a GRE? I, I don't have much experience with those preparation programs. I do have, there was one student who I had who was a master's student and then was applying for his PhD, and his GRE scores weren't great, and he paid, I think he went to Kaplan, and he did raise his GRE scores much more than I would have expected him to be able to raise them. Um, because a lot of the research indicates that people's scores don't go up that much with preparation, unless, um, unless they, take, they took the test and you know, it was a really, really bad day for them kind of thing. Um, I would do the pretest. There's a lot of pretest you can or test you can do online for free. I would use that free resource first, and um, see what your scores are with, by taking the, the you know the samples and working with the question types and so forth, and see where you're at, and then really think about whether that paying all that money for a prep course would be really worth it. Um, and for some programs, it's not going to matter that much. Um, so I would be hesitant to spend a lot of money on a preparation course. Um, suppose you wanted to jump ship and switch topic areas from your undergrad to your master's in like completely different directions. Like, How feasible is, t is that to do? OK, when you say jump topics like from say I'm a science major and say I wanted to do something else, like I don't know, education or something. OK. <laughs> I'm just pulling these okay. Okay, so yeah, the question, can you, can you change majors? Yes, you can. Um, and it depends a little bit on what you want to go to. There are some degree programs where, like in the discipline of communication, um, you don't have to have an undergraduate degree in communication in order to pursue a master's degree in communication. Um, but it helps if you've got something that's in the social science or humanities area. It's a bigger um, transition if you're coming from biology to, to communication. Um, it's probably pretty tough, and, and, but there are some master's programs that you need to have that preparational experience. If, if you want to get a master's of, of science in chemistry and you don't have a chemistry undergraduate, minimally you're going to have to do a number of hours to bring, uh, to get to a certain level before they would um, either admit you or they admit you conditionally upon you doing these undergraduate hours. Um, but those are good questions for, and, and those are good questions for um, both a faculty member here at Miami to talk to about that, that, as well as when you're talking to, say, the graduate director of the program you're applying to, to say, well, okay, this is my background, what would I have to do? And there are some programs, yeah, that do have prerequisites that if you have to at least have completed like these minimal courses at the undergraduate level before they'll admit you. So I saw a hand. Other questions? References. Okay. Okay. Yes, asking for references, that's a big deal because generally any graduate program you're going to need typically three references, letters of recommendation. That's pretty standard. And so um, the protocol for that is, first of all, you want, you want to ask somebody who knows you, okay? So like the, probably the, the perfect recommender is somebody who you've worked with, who knows you, not just maybe in class, but maybe you've worked with on a research project or done, had some kind of interaction with besides just being in class. If you don't have anybody like that, then somebody who you had um, for maybe more than one class and what you did well in, 
um, or somebody who you had class with, the, at least was a small class, so they had the opportunity to get to know you. Okay, but generally, it's your professors who are going to be the best recommenders. Okay, some programs, graduate programs, may be interested in a recommendation from an employer or something like that. Um, but generally, it's it's uh, people you've had as faculty. The other thing you want to pay attention to when you're asking your faculty is the faculty member who is a uh, has a PhD or is as a, a tenure is a uh, as opposed to just a master's degree. So somebody who's in uh, a tenured kind of position, this is just a full professor or an associate professor as opposed to a lecturer, because when they sign there, not that that lecturer wouldn't have give you a good recommendation, but it's kind of a credibility thing when they're signing their name for them to be able to put professor of that as opposed to a lecturer in is just carries more credibility, carries more weight. Um, so once you've figured out, gotten your kind of your list of who do you think would be good sources, who are good people to, to ask for references, then it's best to visit them during their office hours or make an appointment. It's always better to do it face to face and ask them, tell them what you're planning on doing, you're applying for graduate school in this area and ask them if they would um, serve as a reference. So it's kind of like asking somebody for a date. Um, and then if they say yes, then um, you know, at, offer, you know, plan, tell them that you will send them your resume and a description of the programs that you're uh, applying to. And if they have to send the letters, um, some places still require letters to be sent versus, you know, then you need to give them the contact information of who it gets sent to and where. Um, and if you have like a graduate, the name of somebody of who that letter goes to, make sure that, you, that your recommender gets that name. Because a letter sent to a name is always better than, you know, dear, um, yeah, whoever may, who may, may concern. Um, a lot of times, lab uh, schools are using online letters of recommendation. Um, and so, for instance, if you apply to Miami University's graduate school, and if you're applying to a department that uses the online letters of recommendation, when you are completing the graduate school application online, it will get to, it will pop up, it will adapt to the program that you've applied to, <clears throat> and it will ask you for your references. And you would put the names and the name of the, the faculty member and their email address. And then that faculty member, once you submit your application, that faculty member automatically gets an email saying you've been um, so-and-so, Jane Jones has requ um, requested that you serve as a recommender. And then they have the opportunity to accept or to decline. And if they decline, you would get an email saying that uh, Professor Smith declined your recommendation. But you don't want that to have, you don't want that to be the situation. So you always want to ask um, your professors if they will serve as a reference before you do anything formal and, and, and put them in there. Okay? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question on the recommendation letters. Like, uh, how do students de deal with this kind of situation if um, professors are already rather uh, reference to students and uh, any students want to delay the time to graduate school? Probably go work first, uh, probably like few few years. Mm -hmm. how, like, uh, how do students, you know, save their recommendation letters uh, officially? Uh, if you what if you graduate, you work for a while, and then you are applying to graduate school. How do you get your letters of recommendation? Yeah. Okay. Well, in some ways, not all that differently, um, because the letters need to be current. They can't be letters. You don't want. You can't ask for a letter now. Because you're not going to get the letter. The letter's going to go to the program. So it's not going to come to you. So you can't hang on to it. It's going to go to that program. And so if you're three or four years out from now and you want to go to graduate school, then that's when, that's when those, can, you know, staying in touch with your faculty, those key faculty members, pays off. Because then you contact them and you do the same thing. You ask them, you tell them you're planning on going to graduate school. and um, ask them if they would serve as a, as a reference for you. Now, if you've been out for two or three years um, or more, in those cases, uh, a letter from a, an employer makes sense. 
okay? Because your letters from your faculty are still probably going to be, at least one faculty member is going to be desirable. But it's been a while since you've been in graduate school, and so having a reference letter from your current employer or people you've worked with then is relevant for. But if y'all, you you're all student, currently students, you're going directly from your undergraduate to graduate work, you want letters from, from current faculty. Did you have a question? Well, that question uh, ends up, it's kind of related to Interfolio. So that's a website, I guess, it says that in here. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. And with this guy, no, there's, there's something that goes on and, and you can like have letters of recommendation sent to this web service, um, Folio, and so I'm wondering if, yeah. how that works. Jennifer, can you help out here? Airfolio, is that a service that Miami provides? To have your, to, in other words, uh, the purpose of Interfolio. Here, why don't you? You need that they want to catch that. Why don't you come up here so that we can get you get your answer here? Because I'm not familiar with Interfolio. The who asked the question? The kind of the old way of of doing letters of reference was to have a confidential or non-confidential um, file. And Interfolio is the electronic way of doing that. So in other words, if you know you're not going to go to graduate school for a couple of years, you can ask a professor uh, to send something via um, uh, email or whatever the form is that Interfolio uses and keep it in there. Then when you go to graduate school in a couple of years, they'll have a copy of that. But it's not, I don't, it's not used like credential files were used pre um, internet, but it is a way of possibly keeping keeping uh, something in there. But it does it does cost, and it's not something we provide. But it's not much. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so the question is, if I'm admitted and then can I defer enrollment, how does deferment work? Um, it depends by the program. Some programs will not allow you to defer. You get, if you want to, if you're admitted and you don't want to come for the term that you've been admitted for, then you have to reapply for a later term. You have to start all over again. Other programs will allow you to defer. They will allow you basically to say, uh, to, to accept but not for this term, for you know, a future term. Um, and they'll let you do that for maybe a year out or something. So that's really by program. It varies, um, you just would have to ask. I have another question. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Like, uh, when, when schools schools school review the uh, application, so uh, do they have other, which one is important? Uh, like GPA, is GPA more important than then GI is poor, or uh, is like letter of recommendations important than mm -hmm. GPA? Do they, do they have like a, you know? A, uh, like a rubric or something? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, the question is what's more important, or do programs have a um, rating scale? What's more important, GPA, GRE, letters of recommendation? And it probably varies somewhat. I know that's uh, uh, in, in departments, um, and it probably depends on how many applications they get. Departments that get more, lots and lots of applications probably have a more systematic way of doing it than, than smaller programs. I think most pro programs, what they are trying to, they, a graduate program's goal is, is to find students who are well suited for their program, who are going to be a good fit, who are going to do well, and finish. That's what you know, they're looking for, are students who are going to do well in that, in that program. Um, and so, and they do have opinions about probably you know, on certain things about what's important, but they're, usually they're going to look at everything that they have requested. It's a lot of work to go through all that stuff, and so most programs don't ask for it unless they're going to use it. So if they ask for a personal statement and a writing sample, they're probably going to look at that and they're going to value that. Um, so it, it's all important. Okay, so the question is if the writing sample is required, what do you submit for a writing sample? Some 
programs may provide you some guidance when you're, when you're looking at their admission requirements. They may provide some guidance on what's an appropriate writing sample. So look for that first. If they don't provide any guidance, then think about, okay, why do they want a writing sample? Well, they want a writing sample probably because writing well is an important part of, of the work that you're going to be doing, especially if you're going to be doing a thesis or any kind of a large written project. Working with a student who doesn't write well is a lot more work for a faculty member than working with a student who writes well. It's just a lot more pleasant, and students who write well are typically, they're going to do better uh, because writing is a really important skill um, in education, and so if you can't write well, that's a real barrier to being able to succeed. So you want to then provide a piece of written work that demonstrates your writing skill. So minimally, it needs to be a work that's very coherent, that's clear, that's grammatically well done, uh, that people can read with, and read it through and understand what's being said and not have to reread or go, oh, what's this about? Or, you know, all those, you've all written, read something that was probably not well written. Um, you can read it and not really know what it was said um, when it's something. So you want to pick that piece of work that um, is really well done. It may not matter so much what's it about um, as it is probably that it's really well done um, and it's about something that those people can read and um, you know if you're applying to um, an English program you probably don't want to submit a chemistry paper that has lots and lots of symbols and stuff in it because they may not, it doesn't matter if it's well written, they may not understand what, what it's about. <laughs> but, but otherwise it, probably the form's more important than the content. Mm -hmm. They often goes hand in hand. Um, in the oftentimes on the gra uh, the question is how do you apply for a graduate assistantship? Um, oftentimes on applications they may ask if you're if you're uh, interested in an assistantship, and um, so and sometimes there will be a separate application, and so you have to look for that. Other times there's not a separate application. Um, because, for instance, like here in the chemistry department, there's no separate application because they're not going to, they give, they're going to give everybody an assistantship who they want to admit. So it's all, all one. Um, in other programs where not everybody gets an assistantship, I think that's one of the, you want to talk to the graduate director before you apply. That's one of the things that's, that's part of that. You want to look into the program and you want to talk to that graduate director. You probably want to at least have a phone conversation where you can ask your questions and ask them about the admission process and so forth and get a feel for what they think is important. Um, and so, because you can often do get a feel for well, not only like this questions about how do you get the GA nomination, what's the availability of it, and how much is the stipend, and is it a full waiver or a partial waiver, all those kinds of questions. You can also get a feel for what do they, is most important. What's the, you know, is there a GPA? kind of floor that they're looking at, or GRE score, um, or particular characteristics in a writing sample, or a particular type of student, and those kinds of things. You can get a feel for those kinds of things in a face-to-face -face or a phone conversation. So. Uh, and also, citizenships, uh, fellowships. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something that more or less either the college would kind of work on providing, or is that something that you would look for? Okay. Um, so the question is about fellowship and what's a fellowship and how does it differ from an assistantship and how do you get one? Fellowships are usually funded by the university. Um, they are typically, and fellowships vary, but fellowships usually don't require, um, there's no duties associated with them. A graduate assistant, you're basically an employee. You are receiving a tuition waiver, but you're also receiving a paycheck and you work. You teach, you do research, you do something, and you're being paid for that. A fellowship is more like a scholarship where um, they may provide a tuition waiver, they may provide a stipend, but there's no, usually, um, duties associated with it. And fellowship's one of those terms that gets used a little bit different ways at different universities, so you might find some variations um, at different universities in exactly how they define a, a fellowship. But if usually fellowships are, um, Typically, they're a little hard to come by then, like assistantship. Um, if, if 
the student wanted to take a break for a professional graduate program, mm -hmm. uh, how logical is it or beneficial is it for them to go the academic route uh, versus maybe working? Okay, so your, is your question, is it okay to take some time off between undergrad and graduate school? Is that? Yeah, well, more so if you took time, uh, if law school was your goal, but you just want to take time, uh, and usually they say you can go with your work or get your master's, um, let's say from back to Okay. So if you're, so the question then is, if you're going to law school or something like that, is it better to work or to get like another master's degree in between? Okay. Boy, that's a, that's a tough question. I'm, I don't know what, how law schools would view that. Um, it probably depends largely on what that work experience is. Um, you know, if you're working in a law-related area where you're getting experience that's relevant to law school and that means building your skills that are related to law school, you know, that may hold as much weight as a master's degree. If you're working at kind of a low-level job where you're just kind of biding your time and making money, then it's probably not going to do you a whole lot of good than getting a master's degree. Does that, did I answer your question? Okay. <laughs>